Wait, try it. Okay, so Jeffrey totally freaked out on his family. And now he's upset because his mom and Jeffrey are leaving for a week to go to Philadelphia to supposedly connect with doctors that will be treating Jeffrey's leukemia. In the morning, I was the first one up. As usual, I was really hungry for some odd reason, and I was thinking that Jeffrey was going to have a hard day. So I decided to surprise him with the oatmeal he had never gotten the day before. I got everything all cooked up and had just covered the pot when I heard little footsteps behind me. I started to speak and turn at the same time. Good morning, Jeffy. I made you some. Now, I knew Jeffrey was bruised up from his fall, and I also knew that bruises always look worse on the second day. But at that stage of the game, I didn't know how much worse bruises look on a kid with leukemia. When I turned around, I gasped, and my hand came up to my mouth. Jeffrey had the two worst black eyes. Oh, you went too far, that's all. Jeffrey had the two worst black eyes I just forgot, I can't find where I was. Jeffrey had the two worst black eyes I'd ever seen and his nose was swollen to about twice its normal size. He saw my reaction and winced. What's wrong, Stephen? How does your face feel, Jeffy? It feels thick. Thick and hot. Why? It's um a little swollen. What do you mean? Do I look funny? What if the new doctor thinks I look stupid? I'm going to look in the mirror. Before I could even think of stopping him, he ran to the foyer and looked in our hallway mirror. I ran over and he looked at me with horror in his eyes. Steven, I look like a raccoon. You do not look like a raccoon. Actually, he looked like some deranged anteater, but I didn't figure that would be the thing to tell him. Yes, I do. Oh, no. What if I stay this way forever? You're not going to stay that way forever, Jeffrey. People get black eyes all the time. If they never got better, the streets would be crowded with raccoon people. Soon the raccoon people would find each other and breed. I was on a roll here. The preschools would fill up with strange, ring-eyed children. Soon the raccoons would be taking over our streets, stealing from our garbage cans, leaving eerie trails of dinty more beef stew cans in their wake. Gangs of them would haunt the malls, buying up all the black and gray striped sportswear. The rivers would rise, the valleys would run with... Stephen, you're joking, right? What's for breakfast? Oatmeal. Yay, oatmeal. And just like that, Jeffrey was over his crisis. Which is pretty amazing. If I had a sing If I have a single zit, I want to crawl under my bed and hide with three days worth of food. This kid looks like he lost a boxing match with a gorilla and it takes him like five minutes in a bowl of hot cereal to forget about it. While Jeffrey was eating, I snuck upstairs to warn the rents about Jeffrey's looks. I figured my mom was going to have enough shocks to deal with, so I should spare her this one if I could. It worked, or at least the rents managed to hide their reactions from Jeffrey when they came downstairs. We all sat at the breakfast table pretending to be normal and cheerful, but you know how when you watch the Brady Bunch, you think, oh, come on, nobody is this happy. What's wrong with you people? And who picks out your clothes? Well, breakfast was sort of like that. Only instead of the clothing problem, problem we had an unmentionable cancer problem. The goodbyes were pretty uneventful and Jeffrey even managed to bug me which was probably a good sign. On his way out the door, he turned to make fun of his brother. You're going to school. You're going to school. If he had known what was coming up for his day, he would have been begging me to smuggle him to school in my backpack. Once my mom and Jeffy left, my dad and I just kind of slid around the house getting ready to face the day, not quite ready to face each other. We got into the car, 
without word one being spoken, and on the actual ride, it was so quiet between us that I imagined I could hear the tire treads rubbing against the road. I couldn't wait to hop out of there and get into school, but somehow when we did pull up to the building, I didn't make any move to get out. My dad nearly looked at me, and I kind of stared through his right, sh his right shoulder. After about a minute of this, we both mumbled at once. Well, okay. That was the deepest conversation we would have all week. I got out and went to school. When I came around the corner towards homeroom, I saw Renee and forgot about everything else. She was wearing his shirt that was clingy and shiny and maybe a little bit see-through with a skirt that just wasn't quite doing its whole job. I stopped and stared for far too long until Annette banged my arm. Check her out! There's no way that doesn't violate the dress code. I hope she gets marched to the office. It's disgusting. Don't you think so, Stephen? Stephen? Stephen! So at least Annette was talking to me again. When I tore my eyes away from Renee, the contrast was pretty strong. Annette was doing the 1970s retro thing, I guess. She had on this sweater that was pretty tough to describe. It looked like what you'd get if all of your parents' favorite dinosaur rock bands died and left you all their extra fabric and then a little old blind lady sewed all the pieces together with a tasteful burnt orange thread. It made a statement, though. It truly did. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, my God. I almost forgot. Stephen, how's your brother? Did you get in trouble? I didn't get in trouble, and he's fine. I'm sorry. I yelled at you on the bus. I'm sorry, too, Stephen. I know how much you care about your brother, and you must have been worried. Me? Worried? Maybe. You might notice that this would have been the perfect time to tell Annette the whole story, but for some reason, I didn't want anyone at school to know. It turned out that once I decided not to tell Annette at that moment, it became almost impossible to tell anybody. So for the rest of the week, while I was walking around in a fog, I didn't say a word. I joked around with my friends, played the drums, sat in classes, and acted even more lame than usual around Renee. But I didn't let anybody know what was going on with Jeffrey. It was weird. The longer I pretended everything was normal at school, the more I believed everything was normal. I started thinking over and over again, doctors are wrong all the time. You hear about these malpractice things every day where people get medicine that's not even theirs. I bet Jeffy's down there in Philly guzzling cheesesteaks, having a great time, getting waited on hand and foot by mom, while I'm up here eating all the hungry man dinners on the East Coast, and dad is pretending I'm some odd 13-year-old stranger who's just moved in to keep the microwave warm while his real family is away. Woo! Are you guys familiar with the five stages of grief? The five stages of grief. So the five stages of grief. The first, um, let me share with you the five stages of grief. There is denial. There is anger. There is bargaining. Depression acceptance. So if you had to identify where our good friend Stephen is in the five stages of grief, where would you put him? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. At home, why don't you put the number associated with the, the Word. One denial, two anger, three bargaining, four depression, five acceptance. So I'm seeing threes in here, I'm seeing ones in here, I'm seeing twos in here. All right. Threes. Keep that in mind and we're going to check in with ourselves to see if we agree with ourselves as we move forward. The five stages of grief um, are what people experience after a traumatic event. It could be the death of someone. It could be a traumatic event like finding out your kindergarten aged brother has leukemia. It could be after a very horrific car accident where people 
move through these stages of grief, de denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. You don't necessarily have to follow them in that particular order. So we're kind of thinking that he's um, between, he's somewhere in denial, anger, and bargaining. Meanwhile, that wasn't quite the way things were actually happening. I found out later, I found out later that my dad, oops, I found out later that my dad was getting horrible phone reports from my mom for an hour each night, long after Jeffy and I were both asleep. So in a sense, my dad was shielding me by not talking. I could have used some companionship that week, but maybe I wouldn't have believed anything about Jeffy until I was ready, no matter what dad said. The week went by in this half awake sort of way, for me at least, while I was staring at Renee in fifth period math and praying nobody would make her change her outfit, Jeffrey was getting strapped down to a gurney. While Annette was smacking my arm yet again, a doctor was shoving a huge needle through Jeffrey's back into his hip, all the way into the bone. While I was laughing at some joke the teacher hadn't heard, Jeffrey was screaming as the needle sucked the bone marrow out of him. But I was just thinking about me and how ridiculous it was that everyone except me was getting so freaked out over a stupid, bloody nose. The only times all week when I truly felt all right were the times when I was playing the drums. I have always been pretty serious about hitting the old practice pad at home, but now that I was living in the conversation-free TV dinner zombie zone, I basically had nothing else to do. It was truly ridiculous. Within days, after Jeffrey's fall, I got to the point where I was spending 25 minutes a day playing double stroke rolls on the surface of a dime without missing or even moving the coin. I knew my drum teacher, Mr. Stoll, was going to be pretty impressed with my progress. Before this, he had assigned me maybe two pages in each of three different exercise books every week. But now I was doing two pages per night in each book. I was also practicing for my upcoming conga drum stardom. Mr. Watra sent, lent me a pair of really expensive bongos to use at home, along with a huge stack of ancient Latin jazz records. He had even called Mr. Stoll. They had played in bands together. Isn't it weird when grown-ups have actual lives? To tell him what I should practice on them. Fortunately, my dad has a Stone Age stereo system in the basement with an actual turntable. So I was playing along with at least one whole Latin record each night. I know, I know. You're probably thinking that my new superhuman drum schedule must have been cutting into my homework time. And in fact, you would be correct. Except that I completely stopped doing homework the day Jeffrey got sick and didn't start again until I got busted by my teachers much, much later. I sometimes looked at my homework assignments and occasionally even wrote a heading on a piece of paper as if I was about to attempt the work. But somehow I wound up going to school empty handed day after day. In class too, I just started basically blanking out every period, every day. You might also think that lots of my friends would notice if their pal Steven stopped doing schoolwork, started staring off into space 85% of the time and suddenly avoided any mention of his family. But you'd be wrong there. I think every group of friends has a guy for every different function. Like the sympathetic guy, the funny guy, the jock, the guy who gets picked on. I had never really thought about it before, but apparently to my friends, I had two roles, funny guy and drum guy. So as long as I carried a pair of sticks and kept the humor coming, nobody was going to guess anything was up with me. Except Annette. Pretty much. Every morning in a homeroom, she would ask me what was wrong. The first few days, I would make a joke or say that nothing was the matter. After that, I got more and more impatient with her every time she asked. I kept hoping that if I was just snappish enough, she would leave me alone. Meanwhile, she stuck with me. She was my best friend. Maybe my only true friend but I wasn't seeing it. it. Says there was only one way I was communicating with the outside world at all. 
And that was my English journal. Miss Palma has this rule that if you fold down your page, it shows your journal is private. Well, my journal was starting to look like some kind of weird origami factory with page after page folded on different angles and edges sticking out all over the place. Of course, Miss Palma had to know that I was doing something strange because again and again, I'd be writing three and four pages supposedly about these completely impersonal topics and then folding down all the pages one by one. But either she really believed I was having deep emotional reactions to the questions like, should our school have uniforms? Or she was just giving me enough rope to hang myself. Here's the journal I wrote on the sixth day after my mom and Jeffrey went away the day before they came back. If I could say anything I wanted to, to anyone in the world right now, I would be all over Annette. Annette is not working breaks it. I would be all over Annette. You first, you broke Who died and left you, Sherlock Holmes? Why is it your business if I don't do my math homework? And even if that somehow, in some way, that only you can understand is your business, how is it your business why I didn't do it? First of all, you're not my mother. And second, even if you were my mother, you wouldn't care. You'd be in Philadelphia buying soft pretzels and Italian ices for your baby son, not checking in with your microwave oven maintenance son. Second of all, this is a free country. I have a God-given American right to avoid homework. If that helps me in the pursuit of happiness, don't you pay any attention in social studies? No. I swear to no, goodness, no. Annette. Oh, I haven't even read the chapter for this week, but I know more than you do. You should move to Cuba immediately. And don't get me started on my father, Mr. Personality. If you ask me, he could use a good stern talking to as well. Dad, how about sometime this week, just for kicks, you try making eye contact with me. Would that be so painful? And how about you ask how my day was and then actually listen while I'm telling you. Here are some sample questions. You can try until you get good at this. Son, what did you learn in school today? How's the drumming going? Are you at all worried that your mother and brother have disappeared into thin air and nobody's telling you thing one about what's going on with them? How about the Yankees? I think they might win the series this year. Any supposed father who doesn't even address his son, say once a day, isn't even a father in my opinion. So thanks for being my sperm donor, Pop. Oh, and then there's my egg donor. Why hasn't she checked in with me this week? Am I so drastically unimportant? Is Philadelphia such a remote region of the planet that her cell phone won't work? Also, has she not noticed that there are these things called pay phones that one can use for long distance communication when all else fails? Is it working? It's right there. Geez, she could have sent a pigeon with a message banded to its leg and it would have gotten to me by now. Bang on a log. Send me a smoke signal. Something. Ooh, he's mad at his mom because she he hasn't talked to her a week. Finally, there's Mr. Raccoon Face himself, Jeffrey. I'm sure that by now his face is looking better. Whatever little virus he had that gave him the fever is gone and he's thoroughly enjoying his steady diet of high fat, high sugar street vendor food that he doesn't even have to microwave for himself. Unlike his heroic older brother who is gradually dying of freezer burned food poisoning, by now he probably has every single nurse there wrapped around his finger, waiting on him hand and foot, rushing over to get him the remote control for his 300 channel satellite TV so he doesn't have to exert himself. Plus, all the nurses probably look like older, even better developed versions of Renee Albert. And they're scurrying about fluffing Jeffrey's pillows while I'm stuck here getting lectured daily by Annette. Just because I'm skipping an assignment here and there while the rest of my family is on vacation. You can see how folding pages down was a good call on my part. The climax of the week actually came that afternoon 
It was an all city jazz band rehearsal day. And when I got to the high school, I found out that Brian was at home sick. Because of that, I got to play the drum set for an hour and 40 minutes straight. I was smoking too. I always play well when I start out in a bad mood. For some reason, I always play well when I start out in a bad mood for some reason. Plus, I had been practicing so much that my wrists were just super quick. We played through some of our usual repertoire, like the theme from this old 1970s TV show called Barney Miller, some old jazz standards from the 1940s, and a Disney medley, which was actually far, far cooler than it sounds. Then we got into one of the new Latin pieces, a Dizzy Gillespie song called Manteca. Without two drummers, I had to play crazy fast to make the percussion parts sound full enough. My right foot was pounding out accents. My left foot was clicking the hi-hat cymbals on beats two and four. My right hand was going back and forth between the cowbell and a crash cymbal. Whew, this is a lot of technical language. I don't know. I'm not, I don't play percussion. I'm not going to worry about that. I don't understand it because it's just a lot of per technical language for um, drumming. She's it, moving her feet a lot. To bend it. She is. She? He. Oh. Suddenly a rare and amazing thing happened to me. Suddenly a rare and amazing thing happened to me. I was in the zone. You know how baseball players sometimes talk about games when the ball seemed to be coming at their bats in slow motion, looking like a gigantic freeze frame cantaloupe, just waiting to be pounded? That's how this felt, like I could do no wrong. I was so far up inside the beat that I wasn't thinking at all. My body just did everything perfectly, almost by itself. Mr. Watrous, who usually grades papers while a student conducts us through practice, stopped what he was doing to watch me. I could see a huge grin on his face, but I wasn't affected too much by that until I remembered it later. I was just grooving on drummer autopilot. Then Renee walked in to visit her boyfriend Biff, the guitar wonder. She must have come straight from varsity cheer practice. She was one of only three eighth graders who got to practice with the high school squad because she was wearing her uniform. I hope to God she'd been watching for a while before I noticed her, because as soon as I looked up, the shock of seeing her there wearing only small amounts of lycra and spandex and looking right at me knocked me out of the zone, far out of the zone, as in, oh, Pez, you dropped a stick right in the middle of a song and it went tumbling across the room at about 90 miles an hour and it smashed into the bell of some senior's trumpet and who knew? Brass was so flimsy anyway. By the way, the sound of a high school jazz band falling apart in mid tune while one of the trumpet players is screaming at the drummer at the top of his lungs and the piano player is in the throes of a mad laughing fit is just not something you want to hear. And it's certainly not something you want the hottest girl in eighth grade to hear. Renee looked away, but there was definitely a hint of a pleased smirk on her face for a split second. Then I was distracted by the senior trumpeter's raging top volume spit spewing barrage of verbal abuse in my face. By the time Mr. Watrous had stopped this guy from bursting me open like an overstuffed pinata, Renee was gone. I was mortified. And Annette was still kind of snorting and giggling, which made for a fun ride home although at least she couldn't snicker uncontrollably and bug me about my homework record at the same time. The next morning, my mom and Jeffrey returned from Philadelphia. <laughs>